This interview with Arnold Schwarzenegger comes from the May, June, 1978 issue of Muscle Digest magazine, and it is titled Arnold, a unique, honest insight into Arnold Schwarzenegger, his thoughts, goals, and desires for the future. Arnold Schwarzenegger, his name has become synonymous with bodybuilding or more aptly stated bodybuilding with his name. He is the single force that has given the sport acceptance and made it possible for so many others to capitalize on. Arnold has done for bodybuilding what Presley did for rock and roll. Who would have thought a mere 10 years ago that bodybuilders would demand and actually receive $2,000 for a 90 second posing routine? That $25 could be asked for a ticket for a physique contest and the place would be sold out. That the entire nation would go on a fitness craze with gyms and health spas opening on every corner. Or more incredibly, that an autobiography of a physique star would outsell that of any other sports personalities, including Muhammad Ali's. Was it the times that brought this about or was it Arnold who created and molded the times? What is there about him that differs from Reeves, Scott, Oliva, or even Zane? Why is Arnold without peer and the undisputed king of bodybuilding? The answer, if there is one, lies buried beneath a maze of press copy, interviews, and television coverage, or does it? Is he really the product of a publicity agent's talent who per chance had the necessary ingredients for fame, boyish wit, charm, and a certain naivete? Or are they an inherent part of him, coupled with a keen business mind that carefully analyzes every step before it is taken? I was skeptical when I accompanied Donald Wong, MD, publisher of Muscle Digest, to interview Arnold. It's difficult to explain what I expected, since on a hierarchical scale, Bodybuilders are beneath the likes of the Henry Millers, Dolchayevskys, Bruckners, etc. in my sight. I can honestly say that I have never read more than one or two sentences about him, and that everything I knew, which was very little, came word of mouth from those about me or mutual friends. I went to observe and listen to see if there was a clue or a certain thing that could mostly be attributed to his success, but mostly I went to see if Arnold was really Arnold, John Williams. How long have you been in America? I came here nine years ago. In all that time, it has always been you and Franco, Franco and you. Has this relationship changed or altered in light of his marriage? I like him just as much as always. Ours was a very deep kind of relationship, but of course, we're not as close as we used to be. From the time that I brought him over from Europe, we trained and lived together. And you know that when you are training partners, you get involved with each other. You become a unit, and it's almost like a marriage. Franco and I did everything together train, eat, go to competitions, compete with or against one another, etc. It got to the point where I wouldn't accept any exhibitions unless Franco got one at the same show so we could travel together. It was a very close relationship until he got married. Then someone else took part of my responsibilities. What do you mean by responsibilities? The taking care of one another. He took care of certain needs that I had, such as the cooking, etc., because he was very domestic. And I took care of certain responsibilities that he was not as good at. Now his wife is taking care of them. Did you feel a certain jealousy? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, I thought that Franco married a very good woman. Didn't she get him started in chiropractic school? Yes, and he carried it through and became a chiropractor. So I think that she took care of a lot of needs in addition to being a good housewife. You know, a traditional Italian wife. So you believe that Franco's marriage was a good thing? Yes, I was very happy that he got married, but I also think that a wife would naturally feel a certain jealousy towards a relationship as close as Franco's and mine. So what Franco did was just not see me for a long time, or at least as often as before. Are you still close? We kind of grew apart in certain areas, but in other ways, we will always feel as close. But I really have a need, then I will always call on him. He would be the first one to come. In your nine years of training here, what years were you really training with Franco? I never was 100% Franco's training partner because we only trained certain body parts together. As you know, Franco never had to do squats because he had big legs. And he got away with just big legs for a while, at least until the definition period came on. So we only trained certain parts together. Can you give us an example? Chest, shoulders, arms, and back. But then he just didn't need as much work as I did. I mean, when Franco did five sets of six repetitions for chest, his pecs would be blown up like this, whereas I had to continue chest work and flies for the upper pectorals, lower, 
outside and inside pecs. Franco just did benches and flies, and most likely after the third set of flies would cough a little bit and walk out while I stayed for another hour and a half. You're saying that you had to train harder. Yes, Franco never did train twice a day except for a few times in the beginning. Who trained with you besides Franco? I had two training partners at all times, Franco in the mornings and Draper in the evenings. Another combination was Rick Drayson in the morning and the big wrestler, Wayne Kalman at night. This way, I didn't hear the complaints at night of, oh my God, another two hours of that. I always liked someone coming in full of energy for his first workout on my second one. And this way, he could lift me up and carry me through. When he went to chiropractic school, we discontinued training together and would sometimes only see each other in the evening while I was working out. What year was that? In 74 or 75, we stopped training together. And in late 75, he began training at home. Since then, we haven't been training together at all. Once in a while, we would meet at the beach for a workout, suntan and good time, or in the gym on Saturdays. How do you train now in comparison to before? Not as many sets, nor as much weight. Also, my goal is so different now that when I do my leg work, I'm thinking about skiing and training for it. Whenever I train my upper body, I'm just as concerned with certain areas like the deltoids and things that would tend to relax rather than muscles needed for posing. I know that I will never be in a situation where I'll need a side chest pose. Therefore, I'll never train the chest again, and I haven't for the past two and a half years. The same holds true for the biceps. My purpose is so different now, especially with the Conan films coming up. They want me to be lean, 200 to 210 for the films, but I still have an interest in staying in shape and a certain degree of muscularity. Do you think you'll ever get the yearning to compete again? I doubt I ever will because I have so many other things going for myself that they take the place of Olympia. Whether it's acting, business, real estate, or promoting the book or a film, they don't leave me with much time. And in addition, I don't have any interest in winning an Olympia or universe. I have new ideas on my mind, and it is not being on stage posing. That part is over. Although I still want to be associated with bodybuilding, it's almost like competing without the posing and flexing. Everything else I'm still doing, like preparing for a show, checking the lighting, talking to the guys. The difference is you're doing your job backstage rather than on stage. How has your affiliation with Weeder changed over the years? And would you have considered him a father image at one time? Yes, I would say that he was a certain father image to me. I had a strange relationship with Joe. In what way? I never allowed people to think that he was my trainer because he wasn't. He was always more of a business teacher than a trainer. I was studying business administration at UCLA and Santa Monica City College, but that was just book work. And when it came to practical experience, Joe Weeder knew it all. So when I hung around him, we always talked about business and never about bodybuilding. Has your relationship with Joe changed any in the past five years? I've grown more independent and smarter and don't need as much of his consulting or help. Basically, the relationship has never changed. It has always had its ups and downs, and I think that it always will. When he comes over here, we have the greatest time. But when it comes to business, the thing gets rough. He's stubborn and I'm stubborn. What part did the Englishman Wag Bennett play in your training? If I had to mention five people who helped me a lot in my bodybuilding, Wag was one of them. Not with training so much, but he introduced me to new ideas such as posing to music and presentations to the audience, etc. He got me involved in a different level of bodybuilding. Some people say Kalman Scalak may be the next Arnold. A lot of people have told me the same thing. I've only watched him in two competitions, the Mr. USA in New York and the Mr. Universe in Nimes where he beat Mike Menser. I was extremely impressed with his physique, but his weakness is legs. With such a huge upper body, they look sort of off balance. Which physique do you prefer, his or Menser's? I think that Cal's physique has more potential than Menser's. Mike has all the thickness that he can carry, but he has some basic weak points like the back, chest, and some other things that would be very hard to correct. Cal, Mike, and Robbie are the three new guys that I count on top. Comparing them, they all have weak points, but it seems that Cal could go farther than Menser, but I could be wrong. Is your relationship with Sergio Oliva as caustic as it seemed on the Tom Snyder show? We never got along, and I think that he took the magazine stuff seriously. You know, the black and white challenge that Weider created, the Cuban bomb against the Austrian oak. Sergio took it serious, and that's why he started this to dislike me. I thought he was the greatest bodybuilder of all time, but his personality and character were lacking. He has a tremendous inferiority complex. So in return, I began to dislike him. The people liked it though. 
It seemed like every time you competed, he came in too smooth. He did, and I was fortunate in a way. I felt that he would have been in shape. He could have beat me. Not in 74 or 75. His time was over. But before that, if he had kept his weight down, there was no reason at all for him to go over 220 because he could have easily beat me at that weight. What happened in the 71 universe when Reg Park, Bill Pearl, Sergio, and you were going to compete against one another? Up until two weeks before the contest, I wanted to enter. However, Weeder then told me the IPB had a rule that said you couldn't compete in a NABA contest. Weren't you aware of that? No, not until Joe told me. In fact, up until then, Joe said that he didn't care what I did. However, he changed his mind when Ben came out and said something to the effect of that it could hurt the business and federation. But until then, he had encouraged me to compete with the rest. Was that why you dropped out? With all the pressure that ensued, I just said, screw it. In retrospect, would you have liked to enter? But definitely. I was training very hard, and I would have liked to enter against Bill Pearl. Why? He was one of the guys that I've admired so much and thought was so great. It would have been quite a competition, and I think it would have beat him because Bill didn't have the definition in 71 that I did. Sergio was no problem because he came in fat. But again, thinking doesn't do any good. How is your book, Arnold, doing? Very well. This is the third time on the bestsellers list, and it has been on B. Dalton's and Publishers Weekly's list for two and a half months. But the thing that I was waiting for was the New York Times list, because making that list was very good. And now it is on the list? Yes, as a matter of fact, it has moved from 14th to 12th place, and hopefully it'll make the top 10. Are you still promoting the book? Yes, 150,000 were printed, and thus far, 120,000 have sold. Also, we just auctioned off the paperback rights for a quarter of a million dollars. When will that version be out? By the end of this year. The promotional travel must be trying. It is when I look back at it, but when you don't know what is ahead, it's always adventurous. Up until January 1st, I had gone to 28 cities and did 10 interviews in each one with TV, press, radios, etc. Do you feel your popularity is in any way responsible for the large fees that physiques are asking to pose? I don't know whether or not that can be attributed to me. When will you begin filming the Conan series? Probably in the summer. Will it be a series? No, we will do one major film, a 10 to $15 million budget for Paramount. If it goes well, then they see a possibility for a lot of different stories. But you are only committed to do the one? No, I'm committed to do five, but that doesn't mean anything. I'll sign a contract for five films and a certain amount of money, but obviously if the first one doesn't go, they won't make the second. What type of film is it? For them, it's in the category of Star Wars or Close Encounters. Are you going to be involved in anything else, maybe TV? I don't like to do television. I've had a lot of offers, but it's such a torturous life. I see myself much more in films. The skepticism gradually faded as he spoke, and by the time we left, I was, as everyone else, captivated by his charisma and intelligence. I also found what I was seeking, the answer. Arnold is Arnold.